Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Nice to meet you again. Good morning. I would like to welcome to our hybrid service today for my brothers and sisters who are attending the church here. Uh, it's my pleasure to meet you all. And also for those who are attending the church at home, happy Sabbath. And thank you for those who are attending our church for the first time. We are more than happy to know more about you. And if you want to have further information regarding our church, please do not hesitate to contact us later on. Okay? Before we start our service today, I have uh, three announcements to say. First of all, please pray for our church. In two weeks' time, the church board is going to meet in order to choose the new leaders in our church for the next two years. Please Pray for them so that God provide them wisdom to choose the right one to lead our church. Next, please. Secondly, we have discussed about this. Multi-site, Aztec is planning to extend and to multi-site. Now we have not only three places, but uh, we have Sambawang. And as we already discussed, we need really volunteers volunteers, two person in each place. If you feel that God is talking and you are willing to help us, please contact us and uh, contact Pastor James as well. Next, please. So the third announcement is uh, very exciting. Uh, we talked about these announcements already. And for those who haven't received any information regarding the upcoming Bible study training, now the registration is open. You can register by sending us an email or go to our Facebook or send us a message through WhatsApp. However, the registration will be sent out again uh, by us maybe on Tuesday or on this uh, Wednesday. Okay, that's all for the announcement. I hope that you enjoy our service today. I would like to invite the youth to come to the uh, stage to lead us in the worship. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, glad to see all of you here. So um, let us submit our time and ourselves to God as we sing our first song, uh, 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun.
So now, this is time for us to give back what he has given us, provided us this week. I'm sure that every one of us feel blessed. And now, time for our tithe and offering. There are two possibilities for us how to give our tithe and offerings. 
you can scan the QR code in front of you, and this QR code will lead you to our website, adventistgiving.sg. And for those who are attending the church here, you are able to give your offering and tithe later on in our box. So now let's have our time. Okay, let's bow our head to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you have provided, that you have created for us. The Bible says that we should bring our tithes and offerings into the storehouse, and you will respond by opening the windows of heaven and sending down the blessing upon blessing. Please, Lord, accept the gift we place before you now. May the peace of God reign in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. When I look into your into your loveliness when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you when I found the joy of reaching your heart when my will becomes enthralled in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you. I worship you. I worship you. The reason I live is to to your holiness when I gaze into your loveliness when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you when I found the joy of reaching your heart when my will becomes enthralled in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you i worship you i worship I live is 
As we enter into the time of garden of prayer, uh, let us prepare our hearts and so. Let us reverently seek the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, our provider, our maker, and our protector, through your goodness, we are alive and healthy enough to gather and worship you. We praise you for all that you have given us and thank you in Jesus' name. Holy Lord, we commit all our goods, good deeds to you and ask that everything we do be done for your glory forever and ever. Our Father and our God, we bless your name forever. There is none like you on earth or in heaven. Your children have gathered to worship in your presence and sing your praises. Let us come unto you, sweetest Savior, a provider and our light. We put all our trust in you. We commit our plans to you and seek that you bring them to pass. Dear God, please give us strength when we are weak love when we feel forsaken, courage when we are afraid, wisdom when we feel foolish, comfort when we are alone, hope when we feel rejected, and peace when we are in turmoil. Heavenly Father, we pray for Sandra Berlienter and Sophie Senkungreni. God, provide them, the, provide them guidance and direction. Be their fortress and tower of strength. Dear God, as we open the Bible today, we pray that we would hear your voice. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work opening our ears to hear and our hearts to receive your word. As we think of your unfailing, eternal, enduring love, we look forward to the day when we will worship you in eternity. We come before you with confidence not based on ourselves, but based on your love. Let your praises be in our hearts and on our lips. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief, and of the escape, the tempters by thy return. Thank you for the youth and for leading us in the worship. Thank you, Sister Tabitha, for the prayer as well. Now, time to prepare ourselves uh, to listen to the worship, uh, to listen to Pastor James. The scripture reading is from Mark chapter 3, verse 14. And he called him 12 disciples and gave them the authority of her unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Please, Pastor James. Good morning and welcome to church. 
Welcome to all of you who are here. If you are here for the first time or I haven't seen you in a long time, welcome. Good to see you. Welcome to those guys who are joining us online. If you are new to SDEC, welcome to the family. I know today we have people from Toronto, from Calgary, from Sabah, from Sarawak all joining us, and some from KL and Australia. Happy Sabbath. So later on, if you see somebody coming in in uniform, uh, do not be alarmed. There may be two policemen who will come by later on to just have a look at what we're doing here. So just a reminder to not, not don't freak out. It's okay. They are good people. Um, so just to be, uh, remember your mask and all that and to not linger after service, to leave immediately afterwards. Um, but today, before we get into my sermon, there's a few announcements I would like to make. Uh, first of all, we're trying to uh, continue with our push um, for the new SDEC. So we would like to invite you to not just re, re, uh, expect the church to decide uh, the future on ourselves. We need all your participation. And one of the most important things we, we need from you is your prayers. So we need a church. We need all of you, no matter where you are, if you're part of this community, to pray for us. Because we're not seeking to decide the future based on our own intelligence, our own knowledge. We're seeking to decide and see where God is calling us to and submitting our, our decisions to Him and asking Him to call the people who will lead this church. So pray. Pray for us. Before the church board meets to select the new officers, we need you to bask us in your prayers. Next, we need to continue to pray. We have more people opening up their place for, for the multi-site initiative, but we need people. We need people who are committed to, to handle the, the, the visitors and to to coordinate the things at these different sites. So today, as we, uh, our brother Yanwa just shared, we have one more site, and that's in Sambawang. Uh, it's a little bit out of the purple line, but hey, who cares, right? We're trying to invade the whole Singapore with different, uh, of the presence of God. So there's one more site that's opened up in the north, which as I shared in a church business meeting, is an empty void of the Adventist presence. And so Sambawang, with a new site that's uh, opened up there. So we need people to participate and to handle those sites. And then again, I will ask you to, we have some who have registered already, um, to please register for the Bible study training. It will be done online via Zoom. Uh, we'll send out the registration link again via WhatsApp, the fa uh, Facebook page. It's going to be posted up there and email. If you have not received this and you would like to receive this, and if you have my number or the church's number, please contact us. We'll send it out to you and we'll add you to our list. So somehow we may have missed out uh, on, on your contact in our broadcast. For those who are online, no matter where you are, since it's on Zoom, you can participate. So what we're making available are a selection of the various days and timing and combination. And so far, it's going to be interesting because uh, of all the people that have uh, signed up, we almost have an equal split between every option of the timing. So we have to make a decision on how to have this class. We may want to repeat the class in a few different time slots so that different uh, groups of you can attend at those time slots. We have not decided, but for those of you who have yet to register, please remember to register. So uh, the next announcement is a very exciting announcement, right? Starting next quarter, next quarter, I think, in April, which is not very far away. It's about four weeks. Next week is March. Next week is March already. First quarter is coming to the end of uh, 2021. It's as though we just got into 2020. And then we're getting into the first quarter, the end of first quarter of 2021. What happened to the last year? But then what's happening is the primary class, the primary class, the, the slightly older kids are, are resuming back in church. They're coming back to church for their primary class. Uh, we've got uh, the things that are restarting things that are a little bit back to the, the, the normal of how we used to have things. So the primary class will start. The kindergarten class will continue to be on Zoom. And there'll be two separate classes. And we'll announce more details in the weeks to come. But just take a note that from the next quarter onwards, the primary class will resume back in church physically. Oh, we have very exciting news. Uh, membership transfer, membership transfer. Uh, this is the first reading. This first reading, so there's no action required. Angie and Sydney Wong are transferring from Bayview Adventist Church from Hong Kong uh, to ASDAC. To ASDAC. This is the first reading of their membership transfer. Uh, apparently, their membership has been left there, even though they've moved to different countries, different places over the years. But they've decided to transfer their membership here. This is the first reading. Next week, we'll do the second reading, and that's where we'll vote upon the membership. So just to announce to let everybody know. Right, this, this I'm already really excited about this too. If you do not know by now, Hope Channel Singapore is on level three. 
Right? There's a production studio. It's upstairs. They do different programs. It's available on Instagram, on Facebook, or via the website, on live stream, and then it's available on YouTube. And so they're trying to make our Sabbath afternoons more engaging and interesting. Because of the current restriction, we may not be able to have a lot of the usual church programs in the afternoon and all that. So we do have, remember, I announced one program that's about at 3 o'clock on forgiveness and emotional health. And now they're adding one more. They're adding one more. And uh, they're throwing a little bit more stuff to make it exciting and interesting. It's called a healthy foodie. It's called a healthy foodie. And uh, I believe uh, it's going to be uh, at about 5 o'clock, if I'm not wrong. It's going to be at 5 o'clock just before dinner. Just before dinner. And what's exciting about this announcement is um, uh, I'm going to watch the video and then I'll talk a little bit more after that. Let's watch the, the introduction video first. Go ahead. Okay, so if it's, 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 I'm correct, I remember it correctly, uh, today 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock is going to be the premiere, go to uh, hopechannel.sg is where you'll find uh, this, the video, it's going to be out at 5 o'clock, they're going to walk through how they're going to prepare some of this really tasty and healthy food, you know why I know? Because they did it here. And then I had a chance to taste it. Uh, after they cook it, they'll be like, Pastor James, lunch provided. And I tried some of this recipe. Really awesome. It's plant-based, and it's based upon the research and the study uh, of the Blue Zone. I think by now, many of you who have heard of the Blue Zone research. So they, they look at different groups around the world, of um, a, a huge group of people that live close together and all live to past 100 years old. And the Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda have been found to be the most unique group. Why are we unique? Because they are, they are not from the same race. They're not from the same uh, region uh, in their birthplace. They're not uh, like uniquely secluded in where they live. So in Loma Linda, although in, in Singapore context, it's really far. It's about one and a half hours from downtown LA. But it's in the US and not in a really remote town in Japan or in Italy. And the thing is, it's made out of deep people from different ethnic groups, different upbringing, different uh, birth countries. But then the thing that connects them is the lifestyle. Lifestyle. So there are about other seven other groups in this book called Blue Zone. You, you can read about them on the website from National Geographic um, that... Uh, just was single ethnic group, like the Japanese who live in this remote village in Japan and this group of Italian. So they all are the same genetic makeup, they live in the same place, they grew up together, and then they eat the same kind of food. But the Seventh-day Adventists uh, are the group, in the, especially the group in Loma Linda, they eat slightly different kind of food, but all plant-based. They, they have the co only connecting factor among them is they are all Seventh-day Adventists. And they follow the lifestyle of the Seventh-day Adventists. And so they all live to pass 100 years old, or in the research, at least, at least 10 years more than the average uh, human being. All right, so we're going to premiere some of these recipes of what the food they cook in Loma Linda uh, in tonight's uh, episode, uh, this evening's episode. And also, there will be little... Um, uh, recipes from the other groups, from the Italians, from the Japanese, that uh, what they eat in their region that's plant-based, that's also going to be shared. So it's going to be shown. And there's a competition. There's a competition. Uh, according to Hope Channel, my Hope Channel friends, it says, if you watch the show, watch the show, and then you take a photograph or video of you cooking that dish, the exact same dish, and then you submit it, you'll be in for a lucky draw. And if you win, you can add the list. If you participate, you will get a Hope Channel phone stand. And if you win, if you win, you will get the Blue Zone Kitchen recipe book. 
right? It's a book about this thick, and then you will get it. So if you want to have some fun uh, this evening, uh, 5 o'clock, watch the show, and then try out the recipe maybe tonight, if not next week, uh, buy the ingredients, and then film yourself, or take a photo, and then submit it, right? So the QR code is there, scan it. Um, so you have to post a picture of your dish on Facebook and tag Hope Channel Singapore. If you do not know how to do that, ask me or call them. Call Hope Channel and they'll help you to, to do that. So at the very least, take a photo. But I think it's fine if you record a video of you doing it, right? Cooking and then eating the dish and then your expression. I know there are some winners among us who are really good at cooking. Right? You can do it. Huh? You know who I'm talking about, Sherwin. All right, so <laughs> try it out uh, and then participate, right? We're coming to the end of uh, what I've been sharing with the church. You know, we're going through a, a time of transition, a time of change, a time of moving towards the future, becoming the future church that God, I believe, intentionally is pushing us toward. That this COVID-19 pandemic is not out of God's control. It is not unexpected by God that He knows. And He is using it to transition His church from who they were to who he hopes they will become. And today I'm going to talk about leadership. So tell me first to the beginning of the journey. When Jesus was going to start his ministry, he first had to go out into the wilderness, not by his own choice actually. He was led out there by the Holy Spirit. It is, I don't think, an accident that it will remind you and trigger a memory of another group of people, God's selected people in Egypt, who too have to leave the comforts of Egypt and go into the wilderness. For them, 40 years, and for Jesus, 40 days. And let us go into the story, and I'd like to share a little bit about his experience there. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we'll start from verse 1. Matthew First book of the New Testament, chapter 4, and we're going to go to verse 1. Reading from the ESV version. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. If you, please do not miss the significance of verse 1. That sometimes God don't tempt, but He may allow you to be tempted. And in this story, it was an intentional act of the Holy Spirit of God to lead Jesus out into the wilderness to do what? To be tempted by the Holy Spirit, uh, by, the, by the devil. Scary, eh? Exciting. I think interesting. Verse 2, And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He was hungry. Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, Savior, Messiah, Christ, was hungry. It is easy for us as human beings to forget that when He came, He didn't come to earth with supernatural advantage. He didn't come with a supremely healthy body that doesn't need food. He was a human, 100% like you and me experiencing life 100% like what you and I would experience. He was hungry. And at his worst state, you know, in, according to, to, to research, 40 days and 40 nights is about the maximum, the maximum any human beings can go without food. That's the max. In the averages of human beings, if you go one more day, you'll be dead. Right? So it's not a miracle that no human beings can replicate. Oh, I can do 40 days, 40 nights. You can. You won't be very strong and healthy and able at the end of it, but you can physically. Check the doctors. There are a few doctors among us. I checked it and it says 40 is about the limit, about the max. Not water, by the way. Food, food. You water, you'll be dead by now, right? You need water. So I, I believe he drank water. So, so 40 days, 49, he was without food and, and physically, physio, f physiology tells us that he's at his extreme edge final brink of before death. He was hungry. This is such an understatement. Right? I think his, his body has lost all fat, uh, all muscle mass, everything. He was so thin and skinny. He probably was quite muscular from being a carpenter all his life, cutting wood and making furniture. But at this point, he's lost everything. That's interesting. 
that seem as though God was trying to reset Jesus' life. As with the Israelites, when they left Egypt, they had to leave everything behind. All the advantage he gained over the years of being a carpenter, of gaining muscle, and maybe, maybe being look good, you know, like attractive, popular. God was like resetting his life back to zero. At this point, the tempter came. At this point, it would seem that God the Father has abandoned Jesus. This is the time He needs you, Father. Why are you not there? Why did you allow the tempter to come at this juncture where He really needs help? It may seem for us that God would desert and abandon His people at the point where they need Him the most. And this really felt like that, that experience. But do know that even in the, at a point where you feel abandoned, at a point where you feel there's nothing left in you and you need God and you feel like God is not there, know that you're not alone and unique. That our Lord Jesus Christ went through the exact same experience. In fact, I don't think any of us are at a, have been at that brink of death like him before. The tempter came and said to him, If Eve, that's such a big word, right? If you are the Son of God, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Not wrong, right? I'm dying. I have the ability. Lord, if it's your will, transform this rock into, into bread. God would not not want to feed a person who's dying from hunger, wouldn't he? You can justify and rationalize and think it makes sense. Command this. The devil doesn't seem to be suggesting something that's ridiculous, doesn't make sense, or evil. I see, the temptation is not to transform the bread, the rock to bread. The temptation in this was if you are the Son of God. The question was not doubting the ability to transform or God's goodness. The question here was about the identity of Jesus Christ. And the fact that we all share the same temptation as Jesus, our temptation often can be categorized into three categories. And the first category is like Him, appetite which sometimes is linked to identity. I don't think I have to tell you today how many people suffer from eating disorder and have this strange, dy dynamic, and sometimes very sick relationship with food. They love food, they eat too much, they hate them, bo their body image because they ate too much, and then they starve themselves, they try to lose weight, they go on a diet, they exercise, try to look good again, and then they, because of that, that whole regime of losing weight, they, they miss food, they, ate, they eat again, they eat too much, they gain too much weight, and this crazy, never-ending cycle. Appetite. But more than that, I think even the church suffers from the temptation of appetite. But you know, ultimately, what is the temptation of appetite? Is trying to provide what you think you need by yourself. I'm going to say that again. The temptation, the true ultimate source of temptation of appetite is that we try to provide what we need by our own strength. If you're the son of God, transform those rocks into bread. Provide your own need by yourself. Eat the bread. You can do that. Don't, don't ask anybody else for help. Just You can do it. Can the church fall into the same trap as trying to provide the needs of the church through our own means, our own method, better evangelism techniques, better discipleship programs, more lively worship services? If only we can have our mask removed. Maybe if only we can allow more people to meet in 798 Thompson Road. If we can go back to when we used to have 170 people, we can do much more for God, providing for our own need through our own strength. Could that be the temptation that as that could be falling under? If only we have a better pastor, if it's not Pastor James, this church would grow. If we have a better group of leaders in the church board, this church would grow. Could that be our temptation as a church? If only, if only, if only. Trying to supply our own needs. If our members were more faithful in their tithes, we have more money to do the Word of God. When did God need our money to do work? When the gospel first came to Singapore, not to the Adventist church, but to Singapore as a whole, those missionaries had no money. You read the stories, the first who came were the Anglicans. And they worked in Chinatown, 
to provide for themselves as they, they evangelize to the local people. And then they move very soon to Aukang. Do you realize there's a lot of Anglican, Catholic, Methodist in Aukang? That was where a lot of people lived in the early days. And that's where they started the ministry. They worked among the people. And then the Methodists came, the Catholics came afterwards. And then the Seventh-day Adventist Church came afterwards. They didn't have money. They didn't need money. And he goes on, but he answered, Jesus answered the devil, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you read the entire Bible, you will not find one instance where God suggests that the work is restricted by the methodology, by the finances, by the things that is done. The only restriction that God continuously tells us is by willing hearts. And even that, God says, it's not something that you can force yourself to become, but you have to submit to the power of the Holy Spirit to transform you. The harvest has always been plentiful, but the harvesters are few. We always complain, you know, it's quite hard to reach Singaporeans, you know. Singaporeans are very skeptical, very busy, very, they're not interested in the gospel. That's, I, I don't find that in the Bible. Never once do, do the Bible ever victim blame. If you've never heard of this concept, it's when a crime is committed, the victim of the crime is blamed for the crime. If he don't show off his money, he won't be robbed, what? Really? This person don't come to Jesus because he's stubborn. Really? It is not the people that's the problem. Not the harvest, I mean, not that's the problem. It's the harvesters that's the problem. And it's not even like difficult. Do you know that the Bible called them the harvesters? They know how to do it. When they go into the harvest field, there are the rookie. So one of the things in Australia is you can go on during summer, you can go and do like summer jobs and, uh, and there's always this rumor, this rumor that if you go and you, you work in the, the fields to pick oranges and you pick the fruits because they don't have enough pickers, you can earn like 10, 20,000 a month. So among the international students, they was like, wow. That could provide enough pocket money. I don't have to rest. I don't have to work part time for the rest of the year. And so some of us, with that illusion, would fly to Perth in the summer. We'll fly to Brisbane in summer to the, the farms and and says, I want to be a fruit picker. I heard you can earn ten thousand dollars. And the farmer will say, You can. You can. But can you? That's always the answer. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Tell us what you mean. All right, first of all, I'll, provide, I'll even provide lodging and food. We're like, this is a really good deal. Really good deal. I get food and lodging provided for the whole two, three months. And I just need to pick fruits and I'll make that $10,000, $10,000, $10,000, $20,000. That's awesome. Everyone in the world should do it. Of course, it's only available for three months. That's why nobody do it for full time. But now I'm here. I'm going to make $10,000, $20,000. So 4 a.m. the next morning, they wake you up. Let's go, let's go. And then they drop out sorts of different fields. And then you realize how you're paid. Uh, they paid one cent, one cent per 100 gram. One cent per 100 gram. I like it. So 100 gram, okay, oranges. I think one orange, maybe 50 gram, two orange. So I realized, you know what's the restriction? You can earn 20000 if you are quick and you're good and you see some of those guys who, who goes there every summer and I say, how long have you been doing this? Like 10 years. Those are the guys who earn up the five, $6,000 because they don't need to think. It's a reflex action. And then you get rookies, right? Trying to earn $10,000 doing it for the first time. You wait and wait. Oh, I made twenty dollars today. Five days, hundred bucks. Four weeks, four hundred dollars. Three months, oh, one thousand two hundred dollars in three, three months. Cause I'm a rookie. Those who make five, six thousand, ten thousand, a legend. That's why he said you can, but out of the thousands who come, maybe two. Does it? They are harvesters. They are experts. They know what to do. They've been doing it. 
And so the Bible says the, the problem is not with the harvest, it's with the harvesters. He ca- God calls all his disciples, all his followers, harvesters, experts. Because the method is not dependent on us, it's about dependent on willingness to participate. Because honestly, if I went back every single year for 10 years, I think I'll become one of the harvesters. But of course, I didn't because by the time next year came along, I was too lazy. And then I think it was, I don't know, make $1,200 in three months, you know. I'm going to do work at like Pizza Hut or something and deliver pizza or something. I make $10 an hour. We give up. But God calls us harvesters. Let's not seek to provide our own needs by our own strength and ability. Verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. The second temptation that we face, that the, temp- the devil is trying to tempt Jesus with, is approval. Jesus, aren't you here to win the hearts of people? Aren't you here to find a group of followers who who follow you into the kingdom of God? Hey, that's a shortcut. Come. Here's the temple. Here are all the people. Entire Jerusalem can see you. If you jump down and they see that the angels come and scoop you up, you will fulfill the promise and the, the, the Bible, the Old Testament that says, you are indeed the Son of God. All the people will approve of your action and will support you. See, the second temptation that we faced, that Jesus was, fa- was, was going through, was the temptation of approval. We want to be approved by people, which is highly related to the first temptation, appetite. We're always seeking for approval. We study hard because that's the accepted norm. When I was growing up, I always look at, I'm no offense, it's just who I was. I'm just being honest. I look at the plumbers. I'm like, that's such a dirty job. I'm like, I don't want to be a plumber after I grow up. And my mom would use it. Oh, if you don't want to be a plumber, you better study hard. Like, okay, I'll study hard. I don't want to be a plumber. It's such a hard, difficult job. It's so dirty. Fix the toilet. Perception, right? Approval. I don't want to be that. And then I moved to Australia and I, wa- I wanted to be a plumber. It was like my dream job. You know why? Because the plumber that comes to fix my, my plumbing in my house, he comes and goes, well, what's wrong, man? Yeah, you know, my basin is kind of clogged. And he takes out this book. Mm, all right, that's four hours of work. The charge per hour is $100. $400, thanks. I mean, no choice. I didn't know. Okay, sure. Parts included? No, parts not included. How much the parts? Ah, that's $50, man. I give you a discount, $25, $425. Eh, that's a good deal. Takes him 30 minutes. I'm like, wait, you said charge him four hours? Yeah, yeah, according to the, to our, the thing, you're supposed to be charged four hours. I don't, it doesn't matter how long he takes, it's how much the work costs. And then he drives away in his Mercedes. I want to do that. It's a good job. Next time he came back, I'm like, hey, how, how often do you work? Uh, four hours, four days a week. Man, I want to be a plumber. See, different culture, have different value system. And uh, in Australia, handymans are highly valued. They're skilled workers. Are like, whoa, you're such a good, good worker. They respect that. Singapore, I don't be a plumber. There, I want to be a plumber. Approval is such a weird thing. You never find enough approval to get, to live a life without worries and concern. Can a church be looking for approval? Huh? We look around and say, oh, what are the other churches doing? <gasps> They're doing that. Doing that. Ooh. Can a pastor be suffering from approval? <gasps> what if my members don't like what I say? Oh, pastor, you always preach about discipleship and evangelism. Stop it. It's so boring. Oh, man. Pastor, your son runs up the stage. <laughs> Could we as a church suffer from approval, trying to be like others because they're doing what they, they, is working and we think we look at the Bible, although we don't see in the Bible, we try to copy them because we think that is the way to work. But Jesus says, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Can we as a church, as a people, putting God in, on, on, on test? 
trying to test whether God's word is true, that we don't follow his word, and yet we say, God, you're not providing for your church. You're not transforming my life. You're not doing the word. But God says, no, 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 no. My word is true. It's you who do not dare to claim my promise, and you do not believe in my promise. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory. And he said to him, all this I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. If you fall down and worship me. Could it be that ambition could be our problem? Could it be that ambition to get things done quickly, we don't care about the means and method? Isn't God, Jesus, his ultimate goal to inherit all the kingdom and reclaim the lost kingdom that Adam lost and then to save his people? Wouldn't this be easier? Just worship the devil. The devil, give it up back to you. Take it. Could we be tempted to justify the end by the means? We don't care about the means. We just wear the means by the end, sorry. That we, as long as we get to the purpose of what we want to do, we don't care how we get it done. Can the church be falling into the same trap? We don't care whatever we do. Imagine, you know, I always tell people, you know what's the most effective way of evangelism? or Not evangelism. Of getting a church filled? It's not whatever we're doing. If you put a poster outside, come to church this Sabbath. I'll give you $100 for every hour you spend in church. I tell you, man, next week. Ten services will not hold everybody. If you're counting numbers, that is. Right? Let's stand at the door. Uh, thanks for coming, $100. Have a clock in, clock out, huh? Clock in, clock out, huh? Clock in, clock out. Actually, we can afford that. If you want to do that, we can get 500 members here. Straight away, no, no problem. That's the best if you're counting numbers in church. I can give you a thousand. I just stand at Caldecott MRT, Topayo MRT, Bredo MRT, at the bus stop, and says, hey, go to church, spend an hour there, you get $100. Easy. But that's not what God wants us to do. God wants disciples, not just seat warmers. We're measuring the wrong thing. And the church of the future cannot be measuring the wrong thing. Then Jesus said, verse 10, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. The church shall not serve numbers. The church shall not serve finances. The church cannot serve our personal agenda and ambition. The church must serve one and only God, our Lord. Whatever we do, we must be serving only Him and Him alone. Everything else that we do, if it's not serving God, we must not do. What would the church do? Is the church serving our own desire, passion, preferences, comfort? Or are we serving God in what we're doing? Matthew 10, verse, turn me to Matthew 10, verse 1 to 4. And the crazy thing is this, the crazy thing is this. From our scripture reading, eh? we, thought, we read the one in Mark, the same story, Mark 10. Mark, um, Matthew 10, same with Mark 3, I'm saying. Matthew 10 says, and he called to him his 12 disciples. Note where this is found. This is found in Matthew 10, okay? 12 disciples, note that word, 12 disciples. Who does it include? Judas. And he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and afflict every affliction. Do you read that? This is found in Matthew 10. Jesus just started his ministry. The 12 was not like trained. They've gone through discipleship program that they were like apostles. They're not apostles yet. They're at a point where Jesus just said, oh, you have little faith. Oh, you have little faith. Oh, you have little faith. This is where Judas was still among them. Judas, the, the, the traitor. He was also given authority to cast out unclean spirits. Authority. Not just ability. Authority. To heal the sick. Judas the betrayer goes to a lame person and touch him and says, you be healed, Judas. And this man was healed. James and John who was fighting with each other over who will be on the left and right side of Jesus. Peter who says, Jesus, shut up. Don't tell people you're going to die. 
When Jesus says, you devil, get behind me, all these guys were given authority to cast out demons and heal the sick. You don't have to be ready. You don't have to go through programs and programs to do the work of God. You just need to know where your authority comes from. You don't have to be good enough. Judas, if you talk about good enough, he's never good enough. Ever. If you're based on human perception and judgment. Never reach a stage. You don't need a seminary degree to have authority. I have a seminary degree and I can't heal the sick right now. If you ask me, just like, boom, be healed. I can't do that. Maybe I can. I just don't have the faith to do it. I, I, I still stress when if someone calls me to cast out demons, I've done it, but it's not like I have like, yeah, let's do it. I'm still like, Ugh. confronting unclean spirits still, still kind of concerns me. I still need people to pray when I go in and do those things. But they have to be ready. They were not ready in our human perspective. They haven't pastored for 10 years in the church. They haven't followed Jesus and sat at his feet and memorized everything he has to teach them. And yet they were sent out. Do no, that's what the Bible says. You don't learn by sitting in a classroom. You don't learn by spending a number of years in church. You learn by actually what going and doing. Just like when I'm picking the fruits. I would never, ever, ever get better at picking fruits if I just watch YouTube on food picking. Read encyclopedias and manual. This is how you become an expert fruit picker. Because one of the biggest things of fruit picking is muscle memory. One of the things that, that my friend, the $10,000, not the $6,000, I didn't mean the $10,000 guy. The $6,000 guy, that he could feel whether an orange is rotten or not without looking. He touches it, he knows, he throws it out. I'm like, bro! He's like, you go pick it up. I said, no, one cent, 100 grand. <laughs> I got no time to check. But at the end of the day, I did pick a few that he threw out, and I checked, it was rotten. He knew. He touched it. He felt the, the firmness, or the lack of firmness, I guess, that it's rotten. He just, he picked, pick, pick, pick. I have to like, you know, because if it's rotten, you get scolded by the boss later on. Muscle memory, fingertip sensitivity. You can't do that by reading about it, by thinking about it, hearing about it. Imagine if I sat in a 26-hour class by this expert fruit picker on how to make $6,000 a month picking fruit. Will I be a better fruit picker? I won't, unless I go and do it. Some things can't be, can't be, can't be taught. You have to be caught okay, while doing it. The names of the 12. See, the Bible don't leave you with any doubt. I'll tell you who the 12 are. Verse 2, the names of the 12 disciples are first Simon, called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and his John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. It is intentional that they mention this. They tell you, no doubt, who, who this Judas is. Is Judas Iscariot the betrayer? This is the only place you find an entire list of 12 disciples being listed out. It was to tell you how they are not ready. But they were sent out with authority. Authority is not something that we can acquire. Authority is something that we have to receive from someone else who has authority. I can't give you authority unless I have authority. It's not something that can be earned. It can be like you go to a test, you take a test, you pass the test, you get it, and then you have authority. No, no such thing. You have to be given. Those guys who just came from the back door, their authority comes with their uniform. That's not by them. It's given by the government they've left. <laughs> see, preaching stress. I have to see who comes in. I'm like, oh, a policeman, See, their authority, they have a certain authority. I don't even know them. I don't even know their face, but they have authority because of who they, what they're dressed in. It's given. We have to receive our authority, but we need to know where to get that authority. And it's not by our methodology. It's not by our claim. It's not by what we do. It's not by having more knowledge. And the amazing thing is authority expands when it's shared and it's not diminished. 
if you have more people who can execute and implement what you have given authority to do, your authority actually increases. Do you realize that? Because now you have more people who share your authority. There's a, a, a phenomenon that goes out that the more that authority is shared, the bigger it is. That's the, the simple illustration is those of us who have gone through national service knows. You can't call yourself an army until you have enough soldiers. And so in the beginning of Singapore's history, we actually have to borrow soldiers from Israel, which is amazing. We, we borrow from them, we learn from them because they are just as small a country as us. Because you can't call yourself, you don't know the, the, the rank as you go up. We now in Singapore have three-star generals, but you can't be a three-star general until you have a specific number of battalions, platoons, and, and soldiers. So he only gained the third star when Singapore started implementing the national service system. And we didn't get it within the first year. It took us about 10 years before finally the top military officer in Singapore could call himself a three-star general because finally he had enough soldiers to form enough platoons, to form enough company, to form enough battalions in order to form enough the army, the air force, and the, sea, the, 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 the navy has to be formed Three before he could call himself three star. Authority is expanded when it's shared, and God invites us to participate in Him who is sharing the authority. He who is King of Kings, Lord of the Lord, God of all creation says, Do you want to share my authority? It's given. It's not based on how good you are, it's because of who I am. Bible says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is found in 1 Peter 2.9. It's a familiar verse of most Protestants. We claim this as part of our value system of why the church started in rebellion or protest, as they were said, against the then Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church says that it's a chosen special group of people called the priest. But the Protestant says, no, that is not true. In the scripture, it is clear in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the person who you claim to be the first pope wrote this. He says that the priesthood of all who believes... Uh, we're okay in the Adventist church with this verse because we don't have priests. All right, yeah, that verse, I agree. No problem, pastor. But what if I change the word to this? But you are a chosen race, a royal pastorhood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This verse in our context today claims and says that all of you are pastors. And if all of you are pastors, all of you have a parish. You have a church that you have to look after. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> All of you have a church to pastor. All of you have a group of people that God has put under your care. It means that every believer who is a pastor has a crowd to share the gospel. You have a group that you're supposed to share the gospel with under your care. All of you all of you are pastors, means all of you have a sermon to preach. And all of you have a flock to disciple and grow their faith in. So as that, do not have just Pastor James. As that, today, has at least 40 pastors seated here. Every believer is a pastor. You have a flock to teach and exemplify. Every believer, pastor of God's church. Where is your church? As there is your church, but there is a site that you are a pastor of wherever you are. Your home, your neighborhood, your workplace, your school, 
wherever you are, find your church because God has given that authority to you. Would you accept the authority that God has given to you? And as I should remind you, it's not about how good you are, but how awesome God is. It's not about how trained you are, but about who is training you. Did the disciples meet problems after they were sent out with God's authority? Yes, they came back. Jesus, there is this de demon that I can't cast out. Note, they only talk about the demon, which means they did heal the sick. Throughout the three and a half years, it was not just Jesus who was healing the sick. It was quite impossible to imagine if Jesus had to heal 5,000 people. But all 12, I believe, participated in the work together. They were healing the sick. They were casting out demons. And there were some. It's not that they were entirely failures, but there are some that's harder. And Jesus said, sure, no problem. Those have to do with fasting and prayer. Jesus didn't rebuke them. Are you so lousy? He said, well, no, 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 no. Those are harder. You just didn't understand how with fasting and prayer. All of us are pastors of God's church who who has a church that we have to look for and look after. As much as I feel responsible for this church, you have a church you have to feel responsible for. As much as I'm saying, you know, thinking about how I can grow and teach and disciple this church, you have a church you have to think about how you're going to teach, grow, and disciple. Pastors, are you ready for what God has called you to do? If you have any doubt, go to 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Amen. Let us sing our closing song, Jesus is Coming Again. pray. Father, I pray for you to send your authority upon every pastor that's sitting here. All of them, Lord, you've called into pastorhood to pastor the church that you've assigned to them. Lord, help them see the community they've been assigned to. Grant them the strength, the power, the knowledge, the wisdom to lead the church that you've assigned. Convict their hearts, empower them, guide them, encourage them, and connect them to you this Sabbath day, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.